It's really a lot of uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Prasenja Dwara, who is actually an old friend of, our, of mine, and uh, I guess we go back almost 40 years now. <laughs> it's really quite horrible. I'm uh, 35 at least. Uh, and uh, Prasenjit is, uh, of course, a renowned historian of China, and has, I met him at, actually, uh, one of the areas I met him was at Middlebury when he was studying Japanese, and it was the, uh, you were a student of Phil Coons, yeah. right? And then uh, one of the things about Chinese historians is they actually had to learn Japanese at that time as part of their training. So uh, Prasenjit has always had this amazing breadth uh, and at that period, of course, was uh, known as the, uh, as the uh, bright young shining star in, in, in the uh, uh, Chicago firmament at that particular time. Um, he stayed at Chicago for quite a while, but he's, uh, and had been the uh, chairman of the history department and then um, moved to the uh, National University of Singapore in 2008 as the Raffles Professor of Humanities and Director of the Asia Research Institute and of research in humanity and social sciences. Now, it's a very interesting position because it's really sitting at the nexus between India and China, but also all the flows in the region. And I remember the first time uh, I saw Prasenjit after he'd come back, he, he, I think he was still getting adjusted <laughs> to it because uh, Singapore really can overwhelm you. At first, it doesn't seem that a lot is going on until you actually get there. And then there's all the politics that you have to get through which uh, yeah, he just <laughs> flip flickered his eye, uh, you know, and it's, it's quite amazing. But then at, at the ground level, there's so much going on. And the city, um, like New York and a few other cities, is rapidly transforming with the younger generation. It's one of the leading design capitals now in, in the world. Actually, a lot of work happening in design in different areas, like New York, a lot of molecular movements. Um, when you look at these, uh, ratings of, you know, uh, kind of hokey ratings of global cities. The uh, New Economist Intelligence Unit had a rating of global cities. Um, Brookings, a couple of these have come out. Singapore, New York, London, a few unusual places, um, Dublin, <laughs> begin to appear. And of course, these measures are kind of objective measures. They're quantitative. But when you get on the ground, you begin to see the qualitative aspects. And Singapore is one of these places which is really quite amazing right now. And so I think that um, Prasenjit now has, has certainly uh, gotten used to being in Singapore. But what I think we all begin to notice is that uh, his own work has been moving in, in new directions. I mean, uh, his, his work in the past, of course, has included um, rescuing history from the nation in 1995, uh, sovereignty and authenticity, uh, Manchuko and the East Asian modern in 2003, uh, his edited volume on decolonization, culture power in the state, rural North China, which won the Fairbank Prize and the Levinson Prize of the AIS. And his most recent work is the global and the regional and China's nation formation. I think the other part, though, I, I wanted to say about introducing Prasenjit is, for those of us who've known him for a long time, besides um, his uh, astounding uh, intellectual and academic production and career, he's a bit of a trickster figure. Uh, um, there is a certain quality. You can take a look at him. I mean, he, you know, there's a little bit of that quality right now. And it's going to be shown in actually the title of his paper today. Uh, it is not India and China in the Asian context, nexus. It's India and China in the ASEAN nexus. I mean, so anyway, Prasenjit. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ben. It's a real delight to be introduced by Ben. Uh, uh, partly one thing he did leave out in his, uh, uh, in his introduction was that uh, he was actually the, the real, well, somebody said, don't call me a founding father, but call him, that is. He's probably the founding grandfather of all of this, uh, uh, these kinds of exchanges. For I remember very, from the late 80s, he ran an institute called the Psychosocial Institute, or a psycho Center for Psychosocial Studies, which somebody equipped was on Wacko Drive. <laughs> but but, uh, but it, it started these conversations. Uh, and, you know, and although the India-China, as it were, uh, nexus was not foregrounded, it was very much in the background. And, 
And uh, I think there's almost a, a linear relationship between the transformation of that into the much more, it jumped a few generations and became called Center for Transnational Studies before anyone else picked up names like that. And then um, when Arjun and uh, Ben moved here, I think uh, this is what happened. And I'm very pleased to speak. This is my first occasion to speak at, at the India-China Institute. And I'm very pleased to do that. And uh, I, I'm also very um, pleased to see all this sort of high energy activity on this subject. OK, so that's where China, India, and the ASEAN nexus and a historical view. And uh, I was, when I saw that the conference, uh, that this workshop uh, had both comparison connections and so on, I thought I would talk more about connections. It, so it's about comparison. Uh, it's about, uh, there is a little bit of comparison, but the main research idea is really connections here. And I'm interested in the whole, all the issues that were brought up, uh, particularly in the second, uh, and uh, that is competition, uh, cooperation, and the possibilities of understanding the larger context in which uh, uh, these, these kinds of competition and connections can take place. So, so I, and I want to sort of locate it uh, uh, in sort of the very long uh, historical context, because I think that uh, there's something to be able to see a wider picture. I mean, we do, whether or not we uh, want to be historical, we automatically uh, locate ourselves within some kind of a uh, period frame. And I think it's very important, just in our discussions, to move that period frame a little further back. And I have other arguments that I've been doing. I, it was also very interesting that Sanjay, um, now I forget, there's so many Sanjays here, Sanjay Reddy, uh, 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 suggested that uh, uh, there isn't, uh, uh, we still have to figure out what is intellectually exciting about the study, because in most of my work, the intellectually exciting stuff doesn't come out when we do India-China. But I think uh, there is a way to do it. First, I think by changing the framework of discussion, at least in scholarly work, so that your comparative context or your wider context is not necessarily um, the uh, post-colonial period uh, as we've suggested also, even the colonial period has to be reseen from what was under the radar, but really um, earlier. And that has to do with the old uh, Asian maritime route, which has been studied a great deal by um, uh, the uh, Asian trade people, uh, uh, the inter-Asian trade people, the people who did uh, early modern Asian trade. Uh, whether it's Ke and Chaudhary or Hamashta from the Japanese side and so on. And that, I think, uh, because it gives us a type of understanding of uh, interrelations uh, that were very different from what, whatever you'd like to call later periods, whether it's the Westphalian or the imperial and so on, and allows us to understand, in fact, works of Hamashta and so on try, allow us to understand how the imperial... Uh, period domination of the 19th century and 20th century was an effort actually to ride on and devisibilize the earlier patterns. And this, and when you look at the ways in which Indians and Chinese have spread over Asia and Africa, you see that in fact it draws on this much longer pattern of uh, uh, migration and uh, and movement. And I'm not even going to Buddhism here. That we leave for Tan Sen. <laughs> right. uh, okay, so, and I don't, I don't want to romanticize it. I mean, this whole business of peaceful rise and so on. There were, of course, lots of troubles. Uh, but there was something to it that was radically different from the 19th and 20th century types of uh, modes of domination. There were other modes of domination and maybe worth looking at that historically. Okay, but uh, as I said, uh, we still have to have some basis of comparison. And actually, it's quite remarkable uh, to see how much uh, there were points of, how much, uh, how much parallelism there is. And uh, it may have to do very much with certain broad unification from the early modern period and, and so on, but there have been uh, 
uh, very uh, important starting points, whichever period you want to take, uh, of comparability. And uh, I think that uh, there are, so here are some of them on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. As we see, uh, they were the world's largest and third largest economies. This is this Angus MacDonald's uh, study. And uh, institutionally, we see that there was a Chinese imperial state unified by the Confucian bureaucracy and literati, all of the stuff you know, but I'm just giving you background. A society beyond, uh, below the literati, the uh, scholar gentry, enjoys a fair amount of autonomy and different religious and cultural practices do flourish. But what you do have is a literati, is a very state-oriented literati, and here is an important, I think, point of difference. Uh, in the British, uh, in British Imperial uh, India, uh, the British do create, uh, through economic and legal practice, uh, uh, unified infrastructure for empire. Uh, they start after, uh, there is a, a fair amount of autonomy, of course, below uh, the administrative level. Uh, but the elites have a different orientation. There are not so much state elites because partly because it's a uh, partly because it's a colonial situation, partly because of historical differences. But these are elites that are much more oriented towards communities. And in fact, the 19th and early 20th century start very much. Uh, but these, the, the idea of Hindu and Muslim communities is not what I'm suggesting here. Although those become reified in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But nonetheless, there is much more a community and civilization-oriented elite. Whereas in China, it's a state and civilization-oriented elite. Um, where we see uh, comparable movements uh, uh, in historical developments. Uh, in China, you have the Manchu Empire, 1644. You have reforms, 1898 to 1911, and revolutionary movements. Uh, which is actually quite parallel if you look at the Indian side from 1880s to 1920s. You have moderate and radical nationalist movements. And each one of the, the, the reformers and the radicals are quite comparable uh, to each other. And they take place around the same time. So there are historical forces that are working to make certain parallelisms happen. And then you have uh, uh, anti-imperialist uh, movement of Sun Yat-sen, which gets, becomes uh, a mass movement at the same time that the Gandhian mass movement is emerging. Uh, you have this translation into political mobilization in China. You have the same time it happening in India. So uh, you have the, and the endpoints are also soon after World War II, uh, at least for that periodization. So I think these are things to, to definitely keep in mind when you are uh, looking at, uh, at, at uh, uh, comparisons, that there is a larger context uh, which is shaping things in both places, though obviously they're going to be very different the way they outcome. The political systems also have a, a fair amount of, uh, I mean, you have a Leninist-based system that uh, has influences India as well. Central planning dominated resource mobilization and allocation in both nation states after 1950s. Um, Chinese political elites, partly drawing on their history, but partly drawing on the revolutionary movement, are more uh, are revolutionary and statist. By revolutionary here, I mean is that in an ironic kind of way, they turn against uh, historical traditional culture below the um, sort of uh, uh, the, uh, the state frame. Uh, they seek to radically transform peasants into revolutionary citizens. Leninist structure is very effective uh, for mobilization. And here, this is a, a very much in contrast to the Indian uh, stuff, which, in my opinion, still I remain to be convinced. Uh, the Gandhian mobilization apparatus, which sought to reach to the individual, and in fact, I heard a recently an interesting presentation by Shudipto Kaviraj where he tried to, I think, make an argument. I was trying to push him. I was trying to push him to make an argument about uh, alternative forms of political mobilization in modern India that doesn't necessarily, that works through individual self-formation. Uh, maybe it's a slower way, maybe there is something to it, and so on. But Tagore and Gandhi, I think, were quite important in this, that type of political experimentation. And then we know the other stuff. Political rights are deferred for economic rights. In Indian politics, you have, they work very much within a framework of competitive politics. 
seeks to integrate uh, popular politics into a common identity agenda. This is becomes uh, more and more sort of the whole sub-nationalist political mode in India is much more salient than in China. Um, uh, there's a weak mobilization apparatus uh, for delivery and development, although for identity purposes, where you, you know, have to change people culturally, that's easier done around symbols. But when you actually have to deliver, we know that India has one of the weakest records of delivery um, anywhere in the world, probably. But, uh, um, and, compared, and probably has to do with the nature of politics as well. Uh, competitive politics emphasizes political and communal rights uh, over delivery. Okay, then you see these parallels again, at, uh, which are pretty clear for you to see, especially from 1990, 1991 or so, uh, when you have these uh, rates of growth that uh, follow very similar patterns. And in the last 10 years uh, in particular, since 2002-03, uh, you have uh, uh, strikingly parallel types of movements. Okay, so just to bring you up to date on uh, comparison of reforms, uh, you all know this, so I won't spend much time, but just to point out some broad uh, similarities and dissimilarities. Yeah, actually, ironically, there were more dissimilarities after reforms than before, which is an interesting uh, issue when everybody seems to think that they become more common. Uh, they certainly compete for same resources, but the patterns of reforms were very different. So you have uh, in India a strong legal and financial infrastructure, strong local entrepreneurship, technology-enabled service sec uh, sector, which is probably the reason it develops is because it's not dependent on physical infrastructure. Uh, a diaspora role in knowledge, services, and remittances, and not in capital. Uh, principal success in service sector exports. And now, of course, other exports are also taking off. Uh, as I say, they're growing at, they were growing until over 50% in India. Industry and service reforms dominated, whereas agriculture lags behind. In China, as we all know, it starts from agriculture. Right, uh, strong. Uh, well, you also have the Tangshao reform, reform, strong local and central government economic initiatives and outlay, excellent infrastructure for manufacturing, massive diaspora and foreign investment, capital investments, uh, value-added exports going very early, structural growth more consistent and predictable, and agricultural reforms. And this is a presentation I'm going to make elsewhere, where some of you will also be there at Harvard, uh, which is uh, the whole pattern of agricultural reforms is, uh, uh, is uh, reversed. Uh, on the one hand, you have um, the, the reforms begin in the agricultural sector in China, whereas they're not touched in India for a long time. And secondly, uh, the types of changes in agriculture have to do with property systems, incentive structures, and so on, which are not handled at all uh, in India. And uh, those things uh, release a huge uh, amount of energy in the agrarian sector, though, of course, now things are more comparable. Okay, what are first the main areas of tension? We have the uh, border issues, of course, which we talked about a lot. The Hindi Chini Bahai Bahai cooperation till 57, the Tibet issue, the agreement between India and PRC on trade and intercourse between the uh, Tibetan region of China and India. This is 1955, which is a very important development. And what you get is an upgrading, I would say, and I've made an argument, I don't know where Lily disappeared, but. Uh, I think that what the Chinese and Indians did was really upgrade the, the uh, Westphalian into the Panchila system, which was also sort of uh, Westphalian for the decolonized, as it were, so that you don't interfere into each other's affairs once you work out these kinds of arrangements, but then you can continue to be imperialist in other respects, <laughs> right? So. Um, in, uh, then you have the war over the Macmon. Uh, I think one of the very interesting things here, of course, is precisely the impediment that the Indian side has posed to uh, 
resolving the border issue precisely because 62 is such a scar uh, on Indians and Chinese Indians and uh, everything related to that. So that, you know, in the 80s, there was an offer that came through that, you know, okay, we're still ready to swap. You want to take, uh, 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 not Tawang, but uh, Arunachal, and uh, give us Aksai Chin, we can do it. But no Indian government can afford to make that precisely because of that scar and because of the side of political heat that's, uh, that surrounds that so much. Whereas, as we also all know, most Chinese don't even know about the 1962 war. Um, and so for, for India, it's a very fraught political thing, whereas China can always use that as a lever, you know, in many uh, exchanges and things like that. And now, of course, it's off the table. So uh, unless it can, we can think about how it can be brought back, that's another interesting issue. Strategic issues are uh, the nuclear test in 1998. Of course, uh, what has become very clear is that there's also a sense of uh, Indo-US-Japan cooperation and the kind of, uh, which has of course been changing India's um, ability to leverage in the Chinese, uh, in bilateral negotiations. And you have to uh, start thinking of what this role, and I think the Indians have been uh, sort of working quite well on this. And there is a kind of an equilibrium, uh, a very dynamic equilibrium that is emerging in India-China relations where there is more equity, I think, in the understanding of what they ha can bring to the table. Uh, uh, there is the sense that, uh, uh, that the maritime power now is the area that will need to be developed. And this is both India and China are very exercised about this. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the ASEAN nexus later, so I won't uh, stay here. Pakistan and Kashmir, this is, uh, Pakistan has always been what the Chinese have called an all-weather friend, so, and so has Bangladesh, incidentally. So uh, this is something that is, uh, gives it a significant priority uh, in, the, in Chinese uh, foreign policy. Uh, but it has not, but more and more over the years, there are more and more tensions, of course, uh, in that relationship. And uh, uh, Pakistan and China has agreed on many occasions uh, to not push as much as it could on the Pakistan issue. Uh, economic issues, um, again, we're very familiar with. There is a basis of tension and competition over the de developing world in Asia and Africa, resource competition in Middle, Middle East, uh, Latin America and Australia, uh, though of course China is far more uh, dominant and present in those regions than India is. Uh, but uh, there, is a, there, is, there are areas of tension which, but they're not significant I think at this point. And there's also possibilities, though very limited, of cooperation uh, that, that whole Chindia formation uh, uh, in these areas. And there have been two or three, I think, in Syria there was, and in certain other areas where they come together uh, to jointly bid for things, for resources. Um, we know that uh, the tension, that the economic surplus uh, that China has also produces tensions in India. And um, then there are... Um, and on the other hand, the Indians are upset that the, uh, that the Chinese have restricted, are not permitting as much pharmaceutical industries to go into, uh, into China as could be. And in fact, it's a lever that China has always to sort of open up much more of the pharmaceutical uh, markets, uh, because that is in fact one of India's great uh, industries. And we have Falguni here to tell us all about that relations, I think, that relation. Uh, political issues, uh, some of these, as some of you mentioned, Nimi, I think, uh, mentioned earlier, are exaggerated, right? So for a long time, because of Brahmachalani and others, we thought that, you know, the whole sort of river diversion uh, of the Yalong Sangpo and so on would be disastrous for particularly the part of India where I come from, which is Assam. Uh, but then you realize that most of the Brahmaputra waters actually start flowing in 
after it leaves uh, Tibet. <laughs> so it's at the at the point of uh, where it enters that the that the cascades start feeding the Brahmaputra. So it's not as big an issue. I think India has been using it as a leverage for much more. But it could have an effect. There's no question it could certainly have an effect. Uh, political systems and government. I can't remember what I said meant by this. But anyway, OK. Here, are <laughs> here is some, uh, the picture of the, the river conflicts. Uh, conflict and cooperation, although it's not a very severe, uh, it's not as severe as it's supposed to be, there still could be water wars uh, between India and China, but probably there's more danger now between India and Pakistan on uh, water wars uh, than there would be. But of course, the whole issue of, it does raise the, the question of dam building in China and in Southeast Asia and in uh, Northeast uh, at the Indian region and Burma and so on, does have very significant and long-term consequences of what happens to water flows, particular, particularly in an era of uh, water shortage and climate change. And uh, there is now, uh, and you all, we also know that you know there are uh, uh, there are problems with not being able to account for to get real statistics, whether in China or all through other nation states that are accessible to uh, international agencies or to transnational agencies who could monitor and uh, affect this kind of thing. Uh, luckily, recently, China has agreed for uh, ASEAN uh, entities to be able to monitor uh, dam developments on uh, or the consequences of dam development on the Mekong and, and others. So there is something that I want to build up to, that there is possibilities of cooperation here. Um, OK, but uh, you see I have a long section of sources of cooperation. So there are, there are and many of you have also brought up uh, the possibilities, so particularly looking at below the radar of people who've already uh, of non-state, non-official uh, kinds of uh, uh, relationships. Uh, we have a massive trade potential. It's now, I believe, uh, recently has reached uh, 70 billion and expected to be 400 billion and so on, and that's, that's fine. And I think the most important fact, uh, contribution that that can make is create deepen economic interdependence because really I'm coming to this whole issue of how can we avoid tension you know more than anything else uh, and because that seems to be uh, one of the real problems in the future of the world uh, if you begin to have serious tensions and conflicts between India and China I think deepening e economic interdependence creates many uh, types of multilateral arrangements uh, that would prevent uh, one tension from flaring into a centrally consequential one. Uh, we have a case of Huawei, which has been now for well over 10 years, uh, one of the biggest Chinese multinationals with a dominant presence in India, uh, although it keeps also under the radar for obvious reasons. Uh, Bangalore Center of Huawei itself employs almost 2,000 employees, and they're not even into high tech. Uh, so if you look at the high tech industry, there's, there's much more. Uh, there, there's also things like Shindia Steel, not Chindia, but Shindia Steel, which has been established, but not doing too well. And recently, of course, there's been lots of, uh, ever since this recent conference, when was it in March, of the BRIC countries in Delhi, uh, there's been an agreement to set up a kind of a BRIC bank. Uh, uh, that, uh, suggests all kinds of naming <laughs> puns here. Um, and uh, and uh, of course, the main thing is that the main supplier will be the Chinese with the renminbi. And we see this is already happening. The Reliance and the Ambani's have been to China because they can't get money anywhere. They're going to China and they're getting their loans in renminbi. And they're getting investments. The an Indian government company has invited Chinese investments in power uh, uh, equipment development and so on. So I mean, you know, this, these things are going to happen. And the inexorable kind of uh, move of Chinese of this incredibly vast resource of treasure of Chinese capital will have to be spent in these areas. And India is going to be a major. Uh, 
recipient uh, of it. Uh, what kinds of ties it'll have is another one, is something else, but uh, the issue is that uh, it will create very important interdependencies, I think. Um, opportunities for Chindian companies and so on. This is, of course, still looking into the future. There's too much cultural baggage in between. For, but if they did come together, you could, you could, you know, you have the software not just in computers but in management and all kinds of things, research and so on, of Indian companies together with the hardware, not just again physical and infrastructure. Uh, with Chinese companies, these could be easily globally dominant companies if they did were able to create something like that. Um, and there is also, uh, they're both, as we know, rising status quo powers. They don't want to rock the boat. They often cooperate on global issues. Uh, but I thought it was very interesting that uh, somebody mentioned that they cooperate on global issues, but not necessarily on uh, uh, Asian issues. I, I Actually, that was Madhu, I think. I can't see her. Is she here? Oh, there you go, yeah. Uh, I, but we may have a slight uh, difference of opinion here, which would, I think, be interesting to, to see how, to what extent China can, you use the old Japanese word, datsua, right? Escape Asia and become global. Uh, but I think that there are many more ties. It's Gulliver, you know, there are lots of strings <laughs> to, to Asia. And, uh, and uh, we, we have to see how it can work that out. Um, and, but I do agree with you that India is turning more and more towards uh, this uh, Southeast Asia. And also I think India and China are, uh, this will never be resolved because there's too much leverage, but they are uh, increasingly convergent in their concern over Pakistan and Afghanistan in that area. There's of course also a massive room for competition there. Um, and talking a bit about how the Indian leverage uh, has increased in, uh, in the geopolitical realm, I think uh, we begin to see the impact of it from the 2010 when China also recognized India as one of the most important, one of the most important, that was said very carefully in 2010, one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world. Uh, Wang Jiapao has since been sort of reinforcing that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that message all, uh, every time they, they go to India or they, there's a back and forth and so on. So, and in fact, he even makes the, the comment that both are part of the Asian family to promote peaceful and stable regional environment. And uh, I, uh, I was, so this is talking at state to le state level thing. I want to tell you a little bit about, how am I doing for time? Uh, 20 minutes, half, not, yeah. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this West Heavens China India project, which is something that is happening below the radar uh, and uh, is beginning to grab a lot of attention, at least locally among intellectual circles and so on. And uh, it is uh, it was started by this uh, by Chen Guangxing in Taiwan as an advisor to. Uh, uh, T.Z. Chang, who is one of the greatest uh, and very intellectually respectable uh, art dealers in, in, in Hong Kong. And it also happens, he also happens to be the brother of another Chang, uh, who is Chang Sun Ren, uh, who is the, uh, the principal owner of Sun, uh, Sun uh, what is that? They're the world's biggest producer of m m photovoltaic micro, micro, uh, cells. Uh, 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 and he, uh, so they put in all this money for, to develop India-China. I mean, these, these two brothers are basically, they dress like Confucians from the early 20th century. They wear those round glasses and they wear these things. And, and they're, but theirs is a very idealistic Confucian project. Bring back history, bring back Asian ties and so on. So they started this in 2010. It was first supposed to be an art exhibition, but they also had eight uh, Indian intellectuals speaking to Chinese, and it got a lot of publicity. I was luckily one of them. And then they produce volumes that they keep producing uh, out of this. But it's really taken off, and what's taken off is the art part. The art, cinema, popular culture is now moving to different cities. Uh, this, I couldn't do a good, uh, but this is West Heavens. 
and there are all kinds of architecture, design, where has Ben? Yes, design is a very important part of this. You, some of you will recognize Ashish Nandi here with Chen Guan Xing. And um, then there are uh, all these Indian artists, and I actually have never done art before, but I gave a talk because I was so inspired by these art exchange. Uh, but I don't have time to do it here. And, but so there are all these things happening, and I think there would be great interest in different sectors of Indian and Chinese population to have more art, cultural exchanges, and so on going on. Um, uh, Nirupama Rao started a kind of Indian cultural, uh, when she was ambassador, Indian ambassador to China, started this uh, uh, a cultural show, I think. What is it? Cultural center, which would show all kinds of things. And this, as, you, as you all know, Tagore and so on are very deeply popular in China. And I think there's no better, uh, nothing one can't do better than set up Tagore centers all over China to, to promote this. And, you know, an equivalent, I don't think Confucius Institutes would do as well. And they're not doing as well <laughs> in India. But something uh, better, Mao Institutes, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so this, there is this stuff happening. And uh, I think uh, I also see it as part of our purpose to sort of catalyze these things, to make them happen more, uh, so that uh, you know, they develop a kind of a flow of their own. OK, now to talk about ASEAN. Uh, although I still call it Asian regional integration, but it mainly refers to ASEAN. And, uh, ben, I think, very correctly pointed out that the, my interest in this uh, developed before. In fact, one of the reasons I went to Singapore is because I thought it would have the, it would be the ideal place to work on these kinds of uh, relations. Because Singapore, for those of you who are not familiar, is a place which has very little sort of historical culture of its own. It is really migrant communities, mostly Chinese, lots of Indians, Malays, and so on. And these are the people who are involved in precisely so in, in, and for its survival, it needs a rising Asia because it is very much still a sort of a, it's not just an entrepot for these uh, economies. They're, it's an entrepot for these cultures. You know, it's a meta entrepot in some ways. And its existence depends on the flourishing of this, uh, of the relations between these. And in, fec in fact, I, I've written a, a, a piece uh, that I think it's on the basis of that that Ashok uh, invited me to this called Asian Redux, uh, Conceptualizing Region for Our Times. And uh, uh, where it became very clear to me in my research there that, uh, that there was actual economic uh, interdependencies and integration growing uh, very significantly in this part of Asia, especially after the first Asian financial crisis. And uh, ever since the Western financial crisis, it has been growing uh, much more deeply, I think. Um, we see here the ADP report increasing integration of 16 countries. Uh, before 1998, the trade between Asian countries uh, had, uh, the proportion was only 33%. Of course, before 1945, it was much higher. Uh, but then uh, it went down and went up to over 52% after the Asian financial crisis. Right now, it's probably over 70%. So, I mean, you know, you're talking about very rapid movement, very rapid transformation of these uh, geographies of trade. And, and a lot of it is, has to do with the vertical supply uh, chain production networks, uh, where, you know, now you can't figure out any product that is from. But the, the point was that earlier, the, the destiny of these products was to be consumed in the developed worlds of Europe, America, and Japan. But right now, they're being consumed all over Asia as well. And I mean, it'd be interesting to see the consumption figures, which I haven't had a chance to look at. And I think that's, uh, that's something that has also taken place over the last three years or so. Financial integration is weaker, but maybe just as well for the time being, seeing what's happening with the euro in, uh, in Europe. Uh, it will need a lot more time for a diverse place like Asia to have any kinds of, I mean, they used to talk a lot about common currency in the 2008 and 9, and then suddenly people stopped talking about it. It sort of disappeared <laughs> from the lingo. 
right, in Asia. Um, there's also a lot more integration in, in, in tourism, high and popular arts, and in religion, and all these new religious movements going from China. I remember I used to give a, a talk where I used to end with how the two Falun Kung representatives in Mumbai in the late uh, early 2000s were both Swedes. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> and they used to run a big, and they had a huge following, as you can imagine, in India, whereas Sai Baba now is, uh, has a huge following all over Asia, including parts of China as well. And one of the very rapidly growing movements in China is, is not just Christianity, but Baha'i as well, you know. And uh, I met a group where their children married. They were both Baha'i, and they married in Bangalore. They met in Bangalore, and they married. So there are all kinds of sort of things happening that is not yet quantifiable, but uh, that is indicative, I think. Um, ASEAN is uh, the hub of Asian integration. India is increasing its interdependency with the region, particularly with individual and ASEAN FTAs. India stands as now ASEAN's fourth biggest trading partner and accounts for 10% of India's global trade. And I expect this will also grow uh, considerably once these ASEAN FTAs, once a service FTA is signed by uh, uh, the ASEAN people, uh, the ASEAN countries. Now, why, uh, why do I think regionalism is happening? I think regions uh, are emerging, are very much actually a consequence of globalization rather than the other way around. And uh, it, it permits smaller clustering of sovereign or several sovereign uh, agencies to tackle spill out problems from globalization. Uh, these are the sort of the reasons I think we need uh, regionalisms. We need to coordinate common and linked problems of regional public goods. Uh, uh, Nimi talked about water as a very important, but also we can think of climate change, public health, environment, which are all uh, uh, can be very regionally uh, pointed, uh, specific. And we see this already all the time, and especially now that Burma is opening up. I mean, that whole Northeast India uh, and its connection with the highways and connections created in Indochina is going to become very significant and the linkages there are going to be uh, uh, potentially both problematic and uh, great opportunities. So, uh, but as we know, regional involvement can preempt uh, China-India confrontation, which, as I've said, could have a terrible effect fallout on the world and in Asia in particular. So rising tensions might affect Singapore through ethnic links. So this was, of course, made for Singaporeans, <laughs> the, this comment. Um, just to give you a quick uh, rundown on what China's role, and this is, of course, the critical issue, because as uh, Madhu and others pointed out, the whole Chinese role in Southeast Asia now is a very complex and a very important one. Uh, because historically, you know, China has always had, this has been China's Asian hinterland, much more than Central Asia. It's been Southeast Asia, that's where Chinese migrants have gone out, that was the source of a lot of goods within China, right from the Asian maritime period. In fact, it is connected, directly connected from the period of Asian maritime trade, uh, from the 12th century onwards. And by and large, although Chinese prevented uh, or uh, banned trade precisely because it produced so many opportunities and problems uh, through some of those 15, 14, 15 centuries, uh, they still, they, they could not stop it. It was a very important source and outflow of migrants and so on as well. So, um, and this was the central region for its tribute zone. Also, as we know, by now, ethnic Chinese population in Southeast Asia is wealthy, influential, and willing to assist. And during the early PRC, this was actually the only zone of influence that it could have in Asia. Because, you know, of the Cold War, uh, if you look at the way in which the Cold War incarcerated China and then its alienation with the, with the Soviet Union, uh, Koreas uh, were out. Uh, it was only, uh, and Japan was on the other side, and uh, Central Asia was also dominated by the Soviets. So the only connection was to Southeast Asia. And that's where it expended a lot of its Cold War period diplomatic act and uh, 
political activities. And so even during the Mao era, where they, whereas they were supporting, China was always walking on two legs. On the one hand, supporting revolutions in places to some extent, uh, through the Cultural Revolution in Burma and things like that, but also having strong diplomatic uh, linkages. So there is a sort of historical basis for China's role in Southeast Asia. Uh, after 1980, okay, these are details we don't have to go through, uh, but uh, the real engagement once again uh, in Southeast Asia after the Mao period comes with the Asian financial crisis when China refused to lower its uh, renminbi so that, you know, otherwise that would have been the end of those Southeast Asian countries. Uh, if it had also done it. So it played a very important role. It didn't devalue the currency, offered limited assistance when the West ignored the region. Uh, China is also able to utilize the regional context both to balance its bilateral relationship with Japan and the US and to serve as a foundation for its international uh, status, or it had been able to do so until the last two or three years. Now, what is the role of ASEAN? How has ASEAN been? How do we understand uh, ASEAN in this context? Uh, as I've said, the uh, rise of China, ASEAN recognizes that although there are dangers of great power behavior in the rise of uh, countries like China and to a lesser extent India, uh, that it can also be very beneficial economically. China is of course a global power, but it seeks a base in Southeast Asia. And we see that with the with the recent financial crisis, what happened? By 2009, December 2009, when every country was sort of wheeling, reeling, uh, South Korea's export to China jumped 94% compared to December 2008. This has gone back a little bit, but much higher than it was before. Taiwan, 91%. Even Malaysia jumped by 53%. So, I mean, you know, you are talking about uh, massive, uh, increases in interactions between Asia and the role of Asia in China's development. Uh, massive Chinese infrastructural development, particularly in Indochina, the roads, railroads, uh, high-speed rails. Uh, we know about dams that are more uh, complex and more complicated uh, all over Laos and the Mekong. Uh, and Burma, Burma, of course, now the situation is changing, but it's very important there. And um, so although there are political tensions, I think one of the important things to note is how much China and Chinese capital has begun to shape Southeast Asia, at least inland China, Southeast Asia, uh, including Malaysia, I would say, but much more, of course, uh, Laos and Cambodia are the two that have been most affected. India has recently woken up to this and begins to see that it has a role to play in Southeast Asia. Of course, it's happened since 1994, but uh, recently the FTAs and all of this is happening now much more. And it sees the integration with ASEAN as an economic and strategic opportunity, which I think is, uh, uh, is rather late, but still uh, sort of uh, a good thing. Now, What's so important about ASEAN and the ASEAN countries? Now, we know that ASEAN is uh, not very effective in achieving its proclaimed specific goals, uh, many of the things that it wants to do. But on the other hand, there's a second order level at which it has created a kind of format, a kind of platform, which is very significant for understanding how Asia will emerge. The goal of ASEAN is to achieve long-term peace by creating responsibilities and obligations among powers to act within their normative scheme. And one could sort of think of this as if we thought of Panchila as one step beyond Westphalian, uh, we can think of the ASEAN possibility as one step beyond Panchila, perhaps. Uh, but I have not uh, worked this out. This is just uh, stray thoughts that I'm throwing out. Uh, what is the ASEAN regional order? The goal of ASEAN, as I've said, I'm repeating here, uh, achieve long-term peace by creating responsibilities and obligations among the powers to act within their normative scheme. And the strategy here is through enmeshment. Enmeshment and commercial diplomacy have been the means to tie down the powers 
and benefit materially by treaties and FTAs within the, with the long-term goal of integration. So what you have is ASEAN, you have ASEAN plus three, you have East Asian Summit, you have APEC, you have ARF, there are all these formations and you may think that maybe with all of these kinds of agreements and multilateral agreements, none of them are going to be effective. In fact, they have the, the effect, they're very effective at one level in enmeshment and commercial cooperation in all of these matters, which enhance uh, uh, economic interdependencies. Apart from FTA with China, Japan, India, and others, they've succeeded in getting all the powers to accept ASEAN core principles in the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which is TAC, and which is what I think of as the post panchila where, you know, okay, uh, you have to cooperate on certain uh, things. You just don't interfere in each other's sovereignty, which also fits China very well. And it's one of the few things that China signed on one of these regional agreements uh, uh, that it has not created on its own, like the Shanghai Forum and things like that. So, so this is something that uh, we see. And what you see for over the last two or three years is all the powers are falling over themselves to sign these agreements with ASEAN. I mean, now even the Russians are in. They're part of East Asian summit and so on. And I think ASEAN has a very clear vision of what it wants. Uh, so, you know, China would prefer ASEAN plus three, which uh, is just China, Japan, and Korea plus ASEAN. US prefers APEC. Uh, Japan and India prefer East, Asian, uh, uh, East Asia summit, which includes them. And uh, they are all being patronized by ASEAN. But its own idea is to, uh, they, no power, none of these powers can easily afford to ignore or upset this, uh, these, this web of interdependencies. Thus, they're creating the basis of an open and inclusive regionalism, which creates commitment to regional prosperity and peace. But it's a much looser architecture than the European Union which of course sometimes tends to resemble a supra nation states. It resembles to a limited extent, and I don't know if you can see this, let's see. Uh, the, uh, the inter-Asian trade networks. So we are back to uh, what I had been talking about. Because of the separation of political, economic, and military levels and power. So it's a form of investment that does not conflate all of these powers and so allow one to be dominant. Now, it is true, and, and uh, let's see if I have another. Yeah, it is true that there are tensions, and we all know, we've all uh, been reading a lot about the South China Seas and the tensions in particular between Vietnam and uh, Philippines on the one hand and China on the other and so on. And I'll come to that, uh, uh, to that in a moment. But let's stay a bit more with uh, uh, Asian regionalism through ASEAN and the role of China in this. Um, the Chinese, of course, in the South China Seas uh, is far more militarily powerful and is developing something that's more. It may be causing ASEAN to lose confidence in the idea of the peaceful rise of China. India seems to have wisely stayed out after the initial Vietnam involvement of, in 2011, allowing US to play what it regards itself as the pivot of uh, the Pacific region and to come in here. I think this is a very wise thing that the Indians have done so far. Uh, there is indeed growing trends of great power chauvinism in Beijing regarding the maritime region. The Chinese strategy is also to challenge the small powers with the possibility of military action so that these powers have to pull out their navies but also have to think twice. Right? This is what happened with the Philippines now recently, before engaging China militarily. So I think that what, what it reflects in China is that there is a huge division of opinion, that there is no centralized agency that is dealing with the whole South China Sea thing. There are many, and so far, everybody is banking on the foreign ministry in China, which is the least hawkish in some respects. And in fact, this, this month in April 2012, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry said no country, including China, claims sovereignty over the entire South China Seas. So this suggests that the ASEAN regional system of interdependencies is working and maybe the best way of eliciting Chinese cooperation uh, 
uh, is by involving themselves more and more in this. While they will, of course, have that tendency to not be bound by this and to be a global power, nonetheless, they'll still be tied because of uh, their commitments in the region, as I said, the Gulliver role, uh, to uh, be responsible. And I think one of the, what, what could be a very interesting development is out of all this, if there is a kind of a regional maritime architecture that develops, in a sense, uh, across the entire uh, span of countries that operates in this region. Because if it, that, if it does develop, this would involve places like India, China, and uh, Southeast Asia, and Japan, and so on, and make them, at least give them a format to exercise some kind of responsibility and constraint. There's one thing I forgot to mention in all this, is that the ASEAN uh, uh, a vision of the regional order is clear because they have a very clear pecking order. U.S. remains for them the most important power to maintain stability in this. The next most important is China. There's no question, right? After that, then you have Japan and India and so on, who are regional powers. And how to sort of, it's, so the enmeshment is not, they're not playing these powers off. This is a pretty stable model. But the idea is to enmesh them all. And once you get them there, then others will follow, right, and produce this. So that's what I think, that is where I see the hope of uh, India-China relations, the future of Asia in ASEAN. So I'll stop here. You, you talked about uh, the need for a new regional maritime security architecture. Yeah. And I fully agree that whether it is the security of the sea lanes of communications or energy security issues, we need this. But I was wondering, um, what about this competing notions of uh, maritime regionalism, you know, which we see now coming up? Uh, maritime regionalism. On the one hand, we have IOR ARC, Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional Cooperation, which has at least four uh, ASEAN countries. Yeah. Uh, 18 members, more inclusive. China is a dialogue partner. Yeah. On the other hand, more recently, we see strategic communities in US, in India, in Japan, talking about Indo-Pacific, yeah. you know, where, where, where a new strategic space is being created. It is being argued that the boundaries between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean uh, are getting blurred. Uh, in this imagination, uh, India then goes beyond Southeast Asia and, and East Asia and South China Sea. Don't you think that this will pose some kind of a dilemma before, before ASEAN countries? You know, because it, it comes at the crossroads. And as you rightly said, that the nature and scope and the manner in which regionalism will work in this yeah. part of the world yeah. uh, will have, have profound consequences. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm Yang from Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, I'd like, like to raise some questions. Uh, the first is uh, about the strategic challenges uh, between India and China, because you mentioned about the maritime. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, because as a junior uh, scholars in China, we still think that in Indian Ocean, India has the uh, has uh, some kind of preeminence in that region. So how could you say that you are facing challenges from, from China? And also, the mainstream uh, in the academic field in China is to cooperate with India instead of challenging India. This, the second question, uh, because you've mentioned about some kind of supply chain, su supply chain, production network in this region. Uh, you mentioned the first is Japan, and then Taiwan, and then Indian software. So totally combined in China's products. So I'm wondering in this chain, where is Southeast Asia? Uh, 
<laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting because uh, last year one of my colleagues uh, have a very specific studies on this and uh, only one difference is about your conclusion is that first is uh, Japan and then uh, the second is South Korea, Taiwan and then is China and then is Southeast Asia and uh, unfortunately he put uh, India behind Southeast Asia. So I'd like to know your explanations on that. Uh, also, uh, uh, we are trying to discuss in the ASEAN role in trying to promote the regional integration. Uh, in the past, uh, personally I think actually I simply uh, played a very active role. Uh, but uh, it's also a little unique because it seems that uh, it is uh, small states that are set as a driver to, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ASEAN driven. Uh, if we are considering about the United States back into Asia Pacific, how could the uh, big powers, what kind of role would the big powers play in this process, including China and India? Okay, thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you. I just had, I had two questions um, that are related. The first is, could you elaborate a bit on the benefits you see of enmeshment? I mean, I took your main point. You have these multiple forums, formations. Um, enmeshment seems to facilitate certain activities, like commercial trade and so on, but does it also inhibit other kinds of collective action that may be important? So for instance, we mentioned, you mentioned Burma in passing. There's been so much controversy about what role uh, ASEAN has had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the democracy move in Burma and so on. So in other words, what does enmeshment enable and what does it perhaps constrain? And second, in, if you again, you could elaborate a bit on the normative order that you mentioned, because it seems that what it helps in mesh, you say Gulliver is very evocative, but seem to be multiple Gullivers. There's sort of America, there's China, India is trying to be mainly another, China. mainly China. <laughs> Everyone wants, I mean, India is trying to then occupy that role. And of course, these are all states. Yeah. So what it, the normative order for whom and for what purposes does ASEAN and then this, um, then there's a sort of ecology of different regional formations. Whose interest does it serve? And whose interest does it, does it perhaps frustrate? For what purposes? Okay, can I uh, get to some of the questions? Uh, the maritime regional architecture, yes, I think you're right that there are, uh, I have not been paying much attention to the different, uh, um, to the different, uh, uh, maritime uh, sort of uh, alliances that are being developed, but okay. But, um, uh, but I think there's no question that uh, it has to be ASEAN at the center of it, uh, precisely because the South China Sea right now is such an important part of it. And right now, all the rest is, you know, whether it's Cocoa Island or whether it's, uh, you know, the Burmese ports or the Sri Lankan ports and so on, which, and I do agree with you. I think that the Indians are once again uh, exaggerating uh, the, uh, the, the power of these Chinese uh, bases in Sri Lanka and Burma. They're not military bases. They are, in fact, uh, they have not been uh, militarized. And so you can't talk about a string of pearls and things like that with India. But nonetheless, the Indians are worried that there is a greater and greater uh, Chinese influence in its, what it calls, its, it, it feels. It doesn't call, it can't dare to call it. It's backyard, right? Uh, and so, uh, the, uh, so I do think that in that, in that respect, uh, uh, South Asia would benefit very much, India would benefit very much from an ASEAN uh, initiated uh, regional maritime uh, sort of architecture that would also lay down the rules of, uh, you know, of operation and procedure uh, 
and it would have to be sort of uh, also tied to international agencies. And none of these are going to be international agencies dealing with uh, um, um, uh, the law of the sea uh, and things like that. So I think that, that there's no question that this will have to be negotiated at the highest level. Uh, but it would have to stem from from ASEAN, I think, because they're the ones the most to at stake. Uh, on the issue of, um, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I missed your name. What is your name, ma'am? Yang. Yeah. Yang. Ms. Yang, uh, Dr. Yang. Um, I'm not sure your your different questions was how. One of your question was to what extent is. ASEAN, uh, 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 how can it be a driver when other big powers are already involved, right? That was one of your, and so can one see it legitimately as a driver uh, when the US, I think you're suggesting that the US and its agencies are involved. But I think that's precisely what uh, ASEAN itself has done very skillfully. It evokes uh, uh, the US without necessarily involving it wholesale. I mean, you know, it, they could have had an agreement that said, okay, we back all of these uh, US initiated moves to contain China, but other than the Philippines and Vietnam right now, uh, the others are not willing to do that, and which may then produce a problem for this uh, regional maritime architecture as well, right? And we'll have to deal work with, which is why I think of it as a future goal rather than something right away. So I think, uh, the ASEAN structure can, can do a lot, but it is certainly also limited in what it can do. Um, as far as uh, industrial powers are concerned, I think there's no question that these smaller countries, these ASEAN countries and so on, will have to, uh, well, Vietnam is already uh, uh, taking over a lot of the lower value production uh, from China and Chinese uh, uh, and Chinese uh, industrial production is moving up the value chain. Uh, but I don't think that, uh, that this, uh, the, uh, the whole sort of supply chain network is going to be affected by that. I think they'll just move uh, as long as capital is uh, transnational, and more and more of it is. Uh, it is uh, and I think also increasingly, uh, most of, m much of uh, Indian and Chinese capital is also transnational, and they will also be uh, producing in many different places where it is most attractive for that capital to produce. So uh, that, I think, will, uh, will change the geography, as we know very much, from national-based geographies to capital-based geographies, which are linked, uh, uh, which have separate linkages. Okay, now the issue of enmeshment, and what do I mean by enmeshment? and normative for whom. My perspective of normative for whom is normative really for me. I mean, that can only be the case because if I'm making a, a normative argument and I see it as it's the best interest of the region, of the survival, of the sustainability of the region and um, the continued uh, prosperity of the region and peace of the region. So I think that, and of course, this is also what ASEAN is saying, but there is a, there is a, there is a sort of a, a parallelism between mine uh, or a convergence between mine and what the avowed goals of ASEAN here is. I think it'll be good for the region as a whole if this enmeshment. Now, what can enmeshment do and what can it not do? I think actually, I don't know your view on what you were suggesting, but I think a lot of the Burmese developments have a lot to do with what ASEAN has done. I think the role of George Yeo in uh, incorporating, bring, and certainly the Singaporeans are touting it as one of their achievements, uh, bringing Burma, not isolating Burma, bringing it, but on certain conditions, imposing certain conditions for it and so on, uh, has been a lot, uh, has been a big factor behind what the Burmese military junta has done. So in that sense, I think that's been good. It has had a political effect. Uh, yeah, there are lots of things it cannot do. And we see you know, all its climate change, all its environmental things, and so on. It, it doesn't really have the clout to, to sort of stop Indonesian deforestation and things like that, right? So uh, it is harder for uh, particular uh, economic on economic issues uh, 
But general economic issues, yes, I think it can be generally good. Anand. Madhu, Madhu, I think, had her hand up. Just a very brief question. Uh, actually, again, on enmeshment. I was just wondering if you have any figures on how much of the Chinese economy is actually enmeshed in Southeast Asia, in the ASEAN. Mm -hmm. Um, because my sense is that what is enmeshed in the ASEAN is really the small sector, middle SME sector, which is a much smaller part of the economy than the state sector. And the state sector has actually gone global. So I'm, I'm sort of wondering the nature of the uh, enmeshment and the depth of the enmeshment, whether in fact it isn't ASEAN that is enmeshed in China, <laughs> rather than China in ASEAN. Thank you. Anand. Sorry, I don't want to preclude other questions. A number of people haven't spoken uh, yet, so perhaps we could even tr fit in one or two. But I just want to very quickly ask you, uh, uh, Professor Duara, uh, uh, one would be forgiven for thinking that in your presentation today there's a certain disjuncture between what you've presented and, uh, although I'm not a historian, what I believe you are, uh, uh, at least to some degree, uh, known for having done, which is to have presented a, a critical point of view on the construction of the ideas of nation and state uh, in China and elsewhere. And uh, here it seems to me that um, one could be forgiven for thinking that you have engaged in what one might call a sort of raison d'etat or reason of state. In fact, even your answer to uh, Professor Ruparelia was that ASEAN is for the greater good. Uh, now, I wonder whether you could say something more about how the understandings of identity uh, can be expected to change and to sh be shaped by these relationships over time? And to what extent the nation or the nation state are in question or continue to be in question, or is it all resolved? Which is why we have to give up the game and just ask, engage in a rather narrow discourse about interstate relations, to put it a little bit provocatively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sanjeet, I don't want to extricate you from the enmeshment question, but <laughs> this is a different line of questioning. Your point about lack of comparisons or the gap in comparisons post 1980s, 1990s between China and India, especially economically, I think you would get a, a more nuanced argument if you took it down to the sub-national level. Yeah. So a very different kind of argument if you look at India state by state mm. because of the tremendous disparities between, say, yeah. a Gujarat and a Kerala and, say, UP and Bihar. So nowadays we're leaving out Bihar. <laughs> okay. For five years. <laughs> Spoken like a good Bihari. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, figures on enmeshment. Sorry, I uh, will need an economist to to get that to get those out. But I do agree with your general tone that who is enmeshing whom. And uh, it's clear that a lot of the, the concern is because Southeast Asia is being enmeshed. But enmeshment is mutual, you know, and uh, you can't, uh, China will have to be responsible for these regions, for their business interests in these regions. And if you look at where, what its wider involvement is, it's mostly outside of Southeast Asia, uh, even in Southeast Asia to some extent. But outside of Southeast Asia, Australia, Latin America, Africa, it's resource ex extraction, right? Uh, not everywhere is it resource extraction. It gets pretty high value stuff from Southeast Asia. And so, I mean, you know, there is much more, uh, and most, more so from the rest of East Asia, from Japan and Korea, of course but also uh, a fair amount. And there's the agricultural resources coming in from, which are not necessarily primary products. You know, the biggest chicken manufacturers, uh, processed chicken and so on are Thai in all of China. And it's Thai chicken that is, and things like that. I just have few uh, anecdotes like that. So it's not as bleak as you make it out. Uh, it's certainly not the same as in Africa or, or Australia. And incidentally, it's also very interesting that in Australia, the biggest investor last year of, uh, uh, in their mineral resources was not China, but was India. Uh, it, it exceeded uh, 400, uh, well, how many? I forget, I forget the figures, but it is, you can check that. So, I mean, there's competition there. Um, the issue of uh, critique of nation state, 
No, I, I, uh, I don't think this is, a, this is backtracking. I mean, there's a little bit of backtracking in that I have realized over the last 10 years that we're not going to be done with nation states for a long time. But I have also written considerably on how the nation state has changed its orientation. And uh, to some extent, drawing on Saskia Sassen and others, but that it has become, I mean, it has changed the nature of nationalism as well, where there's a split between popular nationalism and state nationalism. But what I think is that as a consequence of uh, the nation and the state be having become somewhat disarticulated, and because of uh, popular nationalism, culture also having become much more globalized, there is in fact the possibility of having identity not glued to the nation state structure in the classic Gellnerian formation. And that I think is a positive and interesting development, although it could have lots of problems as well, right? So that's the basis on which I, I, I'm making a lot of my arguments now about regionalism. And so, yeah, of course, you still need states to, to cover lots of things, but uh, a lot of ASEAN interaction is actually goes beyond state, and the kinds of popular movements and so on, or movements of people by popular movements, movements of capital, movements of professionals, uh, movements of labor, uh, which is much more state than we realize, but there's also a lot under, underneath there, is, is, is very important, I think. And uh, subnational comparison, yes, I think, in fact, that could be a very interesting development. I mean, I think we could do methodologically, if you looked at other economic units, right, within certain sub subnational regions, both in China and India, you'd probably find more parallelisms. And uh, it, very interestingly, you know, and, and you can go beyond that to talk about how you have hinterland states, which have done most successfully, both in India and in China. And uh, what is, and the fact that, I mean, not, did I say hinterland? I mean, hub states, I mean, literal states. Literal states have done much better. And you're also beginning to find much more connections between literal states, right? Uh, I mean, Bangalore is the one exception. It's an inland <laughs> city. But you know now you have airport states, right? So you have these connections much more interesting. And so, in fact, the new geography, I mean, one of the things I'm trying to argue is that it's going to be hubs versus hinterlands. I mean, you know, hubs are going to connect with each other, whereas hinterlands uh, have to find new ways to, to connect and link. So is that it? Thank you.